You're good. You're all set. Okay. So good evening, everyone, and I mean everyone. This is a magnificent turnout and a testament to Robin's work. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Ann Bromer, and I'm delighted to welcome you to Spirit Compass, which is a new collection of work by Robin Price, both in works on paper and in book form. I want to thank Robin for accepting my invitation at Codex nearly two years ago to exhibit at Broma Gallery. And I want to express deep appreciation to our own Meredith Santos for shepherding Robin's dazzling exhibition. Meredith conceived of the idea for this first virtual panel discussion at Broma Gallery and has invited a distinguished curator, historian, and printer who know well Robin's work. I'm very pleased that all of you are here to enjoy this presentation, and it really is my pleasure to turn over the evening to Meredith. Thank you, Anne, for that um, introduction. Uh, I just want to repeat uh, my thanks that you all are here, um, that you all have taken some time out of your Mondays to join us. Um, as Anne said, my name is Meredith. I'm the gallery manager here at Bromer, um, and I'll also be moderating the evening. Um, so in that light, here are a few logistical points. Um, the first is that obviously you can't all be in the gallery with us, which makes seeing a gallery show a little complicated. Um, you'll see a piece of it behind Robin um, she's with me, but in a different room, uh, which is a very 2020 socially distanced way of showing some art. Um, you can also follow along uh, in some slides that we'll have um, on a separate screen. And also, um, if you go to gallery.bromer.com, you'll be able to look through everything um, at your leisure or along with us. Um, also, everything is for sale that's from the exhibition. So if you do see something you like um, and want to support Robin, support the gallery, um, just have a beautiful piece of art of your own, you can certainly reach out to me um, or to any of us who work here at Bromer um, and let us know what appeals. So in that vein, um, I just want to uh, start off by introducing our panelists, say a few words. Um, and then we'll, we'll get to Robin. Uh, so first, of course, is Robin, who's here with us. Um, it's been a pleasure to work with her over the summer um, to pull all of this together. This is all new work. Um, I, it was such a, a joy to see all of the steps come in, um, all of the progress shots she so generously shared. Um, so she'll start us off, and then we will move on to the words of Harry Reese, uh, who you all may know um, as, a, as the printer of Turkey Press and Edition Reese. Um, we'll go to Ruth Rogers, who's the curator of special collections at Wellesley College. And then we'll um, close out with Betty Bright, who is a scholar historian um, and who contributed to Robin's um, Counting on Chance catalog, uh, which you can I'm sure <laughs> gather from Robin uh, if that so appeals as well. Um, in closing the event, we'll also have a question and answer time. Um, a benefit of Zoom is that as questions occur to you, you can submit them through the chat um, and I'll keep track of those and we can moderate them at the end. Um, and we'll all be able to answer all kinds of questions that you may have. Uh, so a few words about the exhibit itself, um, if my colleague will queue up some beautiful images that we took. <laughs> um, in bringing the work together, I really got to appreciate a microcosm of the larger narrative of Robin's work. Um, constructing an exhibit calls for continuity, a macro connection between pieces, and especially um, it speaks to the kind of human compulsion to group like with like. Uh, but Robin's work is so referential, it is so insistent on interconnection that you'll see that the divisions between these groups are largely arbitrary. They are on more shape than anything else, um, on sort of the feelings that get evoked more than 
any particular theme or time or place. Um, so you'll see the walls here are um, covered in cyanotypes, in collage, uh, in a lot of work that um, I often experience as looking through almost a veil uh, at something more, more definite on the other side. Uh, but sort of the, the book highlight um, of our exhibit um, is first a unique book um, that Robin put together called Say Her Name. Um, and it's really the pinnacle, I think, of what this exhibit represents as, uh, as a, a meeting of form and place and time. And um, it's really been a treat to get to uh, include something so powerful um, so quickly. I know Robin is about to go into detail on all of that um, and can speak to all of the work certainly better than I can, but um, I do want to, Robin, personally thank you for letting me take part in the narrative of what this represents to you. Um, and I'm thrilled to be doing this with you. Thank you so much. Oh, there we go. Thank you so much to Anne for asking, for inviting me uh, a couple of years ago. And thank you to Meredith for being so helpful during all of this and doing such a beautiful installation. Um, so the title came from uh, a catchword in my Webster's Unabridged Dictionary. Um, at, we're getting to that. There we go. So it was like, I don't know, a few years ago when I saw um, this catchword at the top. Oh, we're, we're just racing right along. Um, <laughs> there we go. Okay, great. Um, so spirit compass literally is a compass that's filled with alcohol uh, and used in navigation where it might get wet. Um, but of course, it's the poetic resonance um, that was pretty much my um, my organizing principle. And the middle one in this image that you see here, that that was done early on, and I titled it Spirit Compass. Um, it kind of became a guide for the way I proceeded. Um, you'll see these organized in, on the website as intersecting triangles, and they have to do with um, my immersion in Kundalini Yoga as a way to as a way to guide myself. Um, and sometimes I'm thinking about the body as a system of the seven spinning wheels of energy that is part of, of the chakras. And um, they meet at heart center, the upper triangle. So there's two, inter there's, there's intersections on all of these, right? So the upper triangle meets the lower triangle of our, of our bodies, the, the very top being just above the crown of our head, top of our head, and the meeting places at the heart. Um, so now I'm gonna go into process and show that Spirit Compass started uh, back in 2006. I was, I had a bunch of this paper, actually while I was up at Wells College teaching and I randomly with eyes closed and using both hands had oil pastel and I drew lines onto much larger sheets and then trimmed them down. And then before I coated this sheet with the cyanotype emulsion that's light sensitive, that makes it like a, you know, a photographic piece of paper, um, I drew out the schematic of the upper and the lower triangles and those rays with colored pencil. And then I had so much fun during the cyanotype exposures um, in, 
in that a lot of times I had to just think on the fly and respond to, you know, the wind blowing something over that I hadn't managed to tack down well, uh, et cetera. You'll see a little bit more about that. But um, these are catalpa pods from a catalpa tree around the mill. Much of the work, both in rubbings and in the cyanotypes, et cetera, involves interacting with uh, the plant forms around me at the mill in Middletown, Connecticut, where the press is. It's an old historic mill. Okay, next slide. And that's the final piece. The large image on the left was a monoprint on the sheet before the coating. So that white circle <clears throat> was on the sheet earlier. Um, the darker blue comes from painting that part after, after the exposure was done and I washed out the sheet. And then at far right, the kind of fading out uh, from, the, from the center circle, that's colored pencil. That was the last thing that was done. Another image there just to show you, this is titled Triangles of the Body. And above is so there's a locust tree that's so beautiful that I have been doing rubbings from the leaves for a few years, uh, uh, getting ready for another edition book. And um, so, so these are the locust tree leaves and it's a pressure print. Um, and then below that is both uh, hand rolled onto, um, Literally, I was cleaning off my brayer after I'd been doing some mono printing, and so I was just wiping them across that sheet that you see at the bottom. And then it's hard to see that it's actually a cyanotype, but it was. Um, I put that triangular shape on on top of that piece of paper and made the cyanotype, and then I finished up with colored pencil. Just to show you how a lot of these are bringing together disparate parts. And now I might as well say, for me, this exhibition is a lot about recovery and repair. And for the past few years, I've been dealing with um, two different kinds of brain trauma. And um, the most insidious of which is long-term childhood abuse. And I've kind of stepped out from making very much art that gets completed and shown. And I am, I've done a whole lot of healing in that way, still going, but um, part of, oh, and I didn't know about that part of my childhood until just three years ago when I started remembering. So um, that's a really important part of this work. It's about healing and my desire to communicate a reaching out and hoping that these images provide some solace, some place of contemplation or meditation for others. And that literally with these body cyanotypes, you can feel me reaching out. I am, uh, sorry, I don't know if you can see. Can you see me at all? No, there we go. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Um, I'm going to read from a book by Danielle Vogel, The Way a Line Hallucinates Its Own Linearity, as a way to just speak to this a bit more. This is um, the second in a trilogy of books. Um, the epigram before the poems begin here is by Akila Oliver. What is the primary duty of repair? And in a poem that begins, dear reader, she has these lines, between us we'll create another sustainable self, a communal body existing in the wake of an absent one. Okay. I'm going to keep going. Thank you to Danielle for her amazing poetry that gets as unbelievably embodied between 
the words she's presenting and the reader viewer. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, next slide. Okay, so here, before the uh, cyanotype was done, I drew those uh, large arcs that you see going two different directions from the center with colored pencil. And this is uh, what it was like doing the exposure with my dog, Ezzy, walking in the background. Um, I, okay. Um, all right. We need to jump out of here and quickly go to later in the show. We're just going to slide by these. You can see some exposures. Uh, this one, uh, let's just go back real quick. Here, I was rotating. So the top of my head is actually what is at the top here. And I didn't want my body to be like this still thing. Uh, I wanted to rotate. So I was lifting, I was, lift, I was rotating at my hips, lifting them, that you can sort of see literally like the sweat lines, like three fourths of the way down. Um, and uh, so I just wanted to kind of, even if, you know, a human presence isn't what you register, but, but this connection with some kind of presence and the leaves around is what I was going for. And this is the way it was finished. I believe this one is titled Bodies of Memory. And the collage on the left there, that ring, is um, uh, rubbings of locust leaves. This I was blowing on the sand to make this one called the movement of sand. I'm going to just skip over the contemplative circles and we'll go through these slides and um, we'll get to the ones that I am uh, hoping to get to. This is, there's the 43 sheets that I, I think Betty's going to talk a little bit about these. I'm sorry, I want to get to this right here. Okay, great. So behind me in the background um, is the very newest work and uh, it is Love in the Time, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm excerpting some lines by Yusef Komanyaka from a poem called a world of daughters. And he happened to read this poem to me on the phone. And I asked him if he would email it to me. This is about a year ago. And I did these cyanotypes on both pages of blotter paper that I brought pre-stained with walnut stain that was left over from when I was staining silk for the sheets of love in the time of war. Um, and I lost my train of thought. So I did these cyanotypes at um, in Cahoots residency. That's what I was trying to say. And doing the the cyanotypes um, was returning to a love in college. I I fell in love with 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 hand coating uh, emulsions onto paper and toning paper so that I could get some something other than black and white photography. And so this is my first time to return to cyanotypes and I just can't wait to do more in both uh, two-dimensional wall work and book form. Um, and here's the last side. And I know the time is up. I'm just gonna say in this time that our country now has a chance at repair We have to love ourselves before we can really reach out to others. Okay, thanks. Thank you, um, Robin. That was a beautiful, if speedy, tour through work that um, is, I mean, is striking. I get to see it every day, but I'm, I'm happy we can share it with everyone else. Uh, we'll next jump over to Harry Reese. Take us away. Harry. Thank you. I want to um, talk just for a little bit as if I were having a studio visit with Robin and talk about, just for a few minutes, a couple of things that I would be talking directly to you, Robin, about. 
uh, one of the first items that comes up, and I'll show this, this says monotype or monoprint, if you can see it. And that's one of the issues that uh, people talk about in the studio environment. Um, what is a monoprint and what is a monotype? And as a printer who came up like Robin, uh, I cringed almost every time I would hear someone call a, a unique print a monotype, because we all know that monotype means type, typography, it means the casting machine and so on. But the language that I used during the 40 years that I was teaching printmaking and print at UCSB was that an individual print that was unique was a monotype, not a monoprint. A monoprint would be from a repeatable surface. It's a very minor point. And I think one way to handle that is that I usually follow the advice of Ad Reinhardt, who said an artist's disease is a hardening of the categories. And what we want to do is to avoid some of these difficulties, but they, they will come up. And, and that's um, uh, par for the course when you're around printers and printmakers. And so much has changed for me and for others in the field since we began uh, the work. I did this in the late 70s, early 80s with, with Robin. Uh, the word innovation at the time when I was starting was not particularly a flattering term. Uh, I would talk to old printers and old printmakers, and they would talk about following tradition following these ways of the past. And while we don't want to forget those ways, uh, since I did not have training, particularly as a, as a printer or printmaker, I felt that I was inventing so much myself. And I, when I began to teach, I allowed the students that room to think that they were creating as well, unique work. And that's how I felt about Robin's work for so long, this uniqueness that she does. And I'm very pleased to see it again and to see the new work that she's doing that's tied into some of these other uh, personal matters. In those earlier days, personal was not highly regarded and now things have changed since then. And we can be very happy about that change. I notice influences in her work from poetry and from making books not just the use of the blueprint, which follows in a, in, way, in a way the mention of Philip K. Dick's use of the term blueprint in The Man in the High Castle, uh, in the example that you showed, Robin. Uh, I, I consider and talk about this kind of work as working from the inside out. And that's how we approach our books, where the text determines what we do visually. Here, this working from the inside out is, is apparent in that your images do not necessarily illustrate an idea or a theme. They accompany it, just in the way that many of our books do the same thing. We're not trying to illustrate in the way that the illustrated books of the past were very much a way of showing an idea or showing how something was represented. And Another way of thinking about the influence of other kinds of work, poetry and books and so on, is the repurposing of the print image as a palimpsest, as a way of reusing something that has already been, been used before, but has a trace, something that's left behind. And it's not, not just tracing an outline, but tracing the influence of that idea as we've lived with it. Uh, I like to look for sources outside of art, uh, just as, as Robin does too. I think of uh, a remark by Terence McKenna that we're looking for the felt quality of lived experience. And that's what we're seeing in this new work that I salute uh, and, and acknowledge and see as following in the path of what's gone on before. Um, I also uh, want to mention a few other ideas that we talk about in our classes and have over some time, how there is risk involved in this kind of work. And I'm thinking of David Pye's remark about the workmanship of risk 
as opposed to the workmanship of certainty that normally follows a lot of craft considerations. But I see a lot of risk here, Robin, and I salute that too and praise you for doing that. I, I follow many of these different paths myself in my own work, and we, you know that you've been visiting with us before and you've seen it. But I think when we get right down to the base point of what we're doing, I would close with this remark that emotion is the highest form of information. And what you're doing here in this kind of work takes a lot of risk. It shows influences and shows um, what you've followed and wanted to um, present to other people. And you've courageously also presented that information online and in the information from the gallery. So I think this is a great opportunity for anyone who wants to continue with your work uh, to pick it up again. So thank you. I'll stop right there and turn this over to, uh, to Ruth. Thank you, Harry. That was very beautifully said. Um, Ruth? Okay, I'm unmuted. Yes. Thank you, Harry. That was perfect. Lovely. So I'm delighted to be here tonight with you all and um, speaking not as an artist and not really as a historian of artist books, but as a curator at Wellesley College, where I'm proud to shout out to Meredith who got her start. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to discuss two books of Robbins that I use frequently in teaching, knowing that there's much more we could talk about, but not in the limited time we have. And I hope that the slides that I have sent you today will be um, available for everyone to look at when I start talking about them. So um, incorporating artist books into class visits at Wellesley is something that I do regularly, even when people aren't expecting them, because they need to be seen in the context of a rare book collection, not just as a genre on their own. Um, so I look for books that, that provoke questions that don't tell their secrets all at once. And I guide students to discover their meaning through the material and form. Um, the two outstanding books from Robin's oeuvre that I want to discuss are starting with Love in a Time of War, Love in the Time of War, with um, poetry by Josef Kuminyaka. So hopefully we can put that slide up now. And what you're looking at first is the aluminum camouflage pattern cover, covers that is designed by Daniel Kelm, who I know is in our audience. So I want to thank him for his beautiful work. And I know that Robin has collaborated with him on other books. Um, this outstanding book is the result of a collaboration with the Pulitzer Prize winning poet, Yosef Kuminyaka, and it was published in 2013. Um, Robin already alluded to the book, the unique book in this show that is taken from a larger work of poetry by him called Say Her Name. I haven't had a chance to see that book, but I'm really happy that I chose to talk about this one tonight. So for an anthropology and writing course on storytelling, I decided to put out a selection of artist books that would act on the reader through features other than text alone. I wouldn't call it a lecture, it was more of an encounter which I called multimodal ways of reading. Artist books with their non-traditional forms and material are the perfect genre to provoke and challenge these highly intellectual and debate-ready students who I love. Among the categories I included in this class were types of reading such as random access reading, linear reading, reading without reading, data made physical, and haptic reading, and this is the category where we considered love in the time of war. So students were asked to think about the meaning of the camouflage pattern covers in aluminum, the silver ink on the silk fabric, and you could advance the slides a bit so we can look at those now. Um, and the glassine inserts that rustle when you turn the pages. That uh, has a, as much of an influence on the reading of the sonnets as just reading the text itself. He started writing these when the US invaded Iraq in 2003, influenced by his own experience of war. But in these poems, he also references ancient texts like Gilgamesh and the Bible. The students responded eloquently to the contrasting themes of brutality and tenderness, vulnerability and strength. 
because of the delicacy of the silk, the hand dyed silk and the whispering sound as one turns the leaves, the tempo of reading is forced to be slower. One's eye has to encompass the full page spread with its random stains on a grid of dark brownish red. And stop right there for a minute. What is so gratifying about watching students with artist books, and you can see that on the next slide, is that they're fully engaged, willing to slow down and meditate on the whole book, not just the text. The meaning of haptic reading becomes clear with this book. And I'm so grateful to Robin for producing a book like that because I know that artists want their books to be read on multiple levels. The next book I'll show you is Alter Book for Goretsky, which is coming next right here. This is a tribute to Goretsky's Symphony Number no. 3, the Symphony of Powerful, Sorrowful Songs. The lyrics are printed in Polish from calligraphy by Paul Shaw and in English with Roman and Uncial types. It's illustrated with reproductions from the Ornithology of Francis Willoughby, published in 1678, and an abstract woodcut by K.G. Shinohara. Letterpress printed on paper laminated onto colored wood boards. The structure is very unusual. It's a triptych hinged with dyed vellum and housed in a beautiful custom made cherry box. I've shown this to students every year in a course called the Holocaust and the Nazi state. You can move on to the, one, the next slide. Thank you. Um, it's not really so much that it's about the Holocaust, but part of the text is from a concentration camp actually. Um, but it's important as a memorial. It's as much about loss and resurrection and equally important as a memorial, as a reflection on human suffering, hope and rebirth. There's almost a religious intimacy when opening the cherry box that feels like a reliquary or a chest. It's entirely consistent with the text and Goretsky's symphony that the book is in a triptych format on a support as universal and ancient as wood. The first image that greets the viewer is the 17th century engraving of a specimen. And it's actually on the next slide, you can see it better. On the left, you can see what looks like a dead bird, a specimen bird, and on the right, a bird that appears to be almost lifting itself upward, which is the point of the phoenix, the firebird. Like many of my colleagues who are curators in rare book collections, I'm drawn to contemporary artist books that reference texts and events from other time periods. In a historical collection like Wellesley's, we can provide the context of many centuries of ideas, languages, and other cultures, giving us a wider lens to view them with. Robin's deeply researched, collaborative, and exquisitely crafted books give me the opportunity to discuss recurring historical themes like war and religion, mythology and music with students and faculty. Unless I have a specific thematic request from a studio art class, I try to avoid presenting artist books as fun or quirky or mainly about non-traditional form. I strive first to, to ask how this relates to other books over time. How does the maker transmit meaning by using this form, this text, these materials? How would you read it differently if it were printed in black and white in a hardcover trade book, for instance? So Alter Book represent, presents students with the opportunity to bait the question of what is a book? What is language? How does the layout and form of the book communicate its content? Specifically in this book, students are drawn to the elegiac quality of the calligraphy the woodcut of the flames and their dramatic origins of the libretto itself being comprised of three different laments spanning 500 years. And so to conclude, I realized while Robin was showing us her new work that the themes of the book I just discussed, the books I just discussed are still very much connected to the work she's making now, meditation, hope, rebirth and affirmation. So thank you, Robin. Great, and thank you, Ruth. Um, I obviously know firsthand <laughs> that collection very well. Um, and it is certainly lovely to, um, for me to um, just draw lines between where I've been and where I am now and, and to have Robin throughout all of that. Um, so we'll conclude with Betty, Betty. Okay, great. Thank you very much for having me. I've been asked to talk a little bit about a few of Robin's books as they might relate to this most recent body of work. 
And I'll begin by just noting that Robin has always worked in two dimensions along with her book production. And of course, this is not unusual in contemporary book art. But what has always struck me about Robin's work is that she merges two creative catalysts, uh, the art world's experimentation with new techniques, content, and materials, along with letterpress printing's commitment to elegant topography and nuanced execution. She does it both. So if I summarize what's invigorating about a Robin Price book, it lies in that coexistence, in its respect for the architecture of the page and typography that inhabits it, and yet enlivened as well by her love of language and color and her understanding as material, as sensate, even as sensual in a book, the experience of a book. So these components emerge afresh with each work as if rediscovered again and again. There is that energy that comes with a new Robin Price book. They are not resembling one another so much as giving you that core experience in a new, a new way. So that key ingredient, that artistic incitement comes from Robin's commitment to play in a very high level to apply chance strategies and a deliberate stepping back from control to follow those strategies. And that requires, and this is something we've been hearing uh, from others this evening, it requires a necessary courage, a courage that I think is shared by our best artists. So I'm going to briefly discuss a few books of Robbins, totally lucked out, they're not the books that Ruth discussed, and then relate them to uh, some of her prints. And so not surprisingly, given what I've just said, at first glance, these beautiful prints may seem to inhabit a separate realm altogether from her books. Well, not all of them, of course, and we'll talk about that in a second. But of course, the prints live on the wall. They're two dimensional, right? But there are some clear correlations and I think also some underlying relationships that we might be able to discern. So let's start with Robin's Slurring at Bottom, A Printer's Book of Errors from 2001 with Emily K. Larned. Could we have that slide, please? This work marked a breakthrough. It foregrounded a collaborative chance-driven process in art making for her. Price and Larned harvested imperfect sheets from Robin's earlier books, prepared a new surface that is a palimpsest. And as Harry mentioned that, that's a recurring um, strategy in Robin's work. And then sent half of the sheets to artists who altered and returned them. The book that ultimately emerged was a thing of beauty and rich with content and embodied a different kind of perfection, a perfection more allied with wabi-sabi, a Japanese aesthetic that finds a deeper beauty in the blemished rather than in the unblemished. So slurring holds both ends of that expressive spectrum together between its covers. In one grouping of prints at Romer Gallery, the contemplative circles, Price employs a number of hand processes to produce centralized universal images of concentrated energy, such as flow sacral. With flow, a gradation monoprint of brilliant red orange slowly transitions into gold. One studies the disc centered on its deep dark background, stunning and alluring in evident perfection. And yet come closer and a line emerges and you can see it here, uh, a line drawn in by hand in a spiral executed in silver colored pencil, so subtle that it's only discerned as you approach and come toward the image. So the beauty of Price's drawing is apparent and a viewer is compelled to follow the line to spiral in with her. Its record of the artist's touch on a glowing disc is deeply satisfying. It is imperfect yet focused, even as it succeeds in gathering and concentrating the energy of the disc. Again, both ends of that expressive uh, spectrum held within this image. But flow sacral is different, of course, from slurring at bottom but I do sense a deeper communication between the two that I see in this continuous freehand drawing that activates the color at its center. And as for the reference in the print's title to sacral, and Robin mentioned this, it references Price's investigations as an artist unafraid to seek insight and direction from ancient practices. 
In the chakra system, subtle energies are concentrated in seven centers aligned along the spine from the root chakra up to the crown of the head. The sacral is the second chakra associated rightly so with the emotional body, with sensuality and with creativity. Another grouping of prints relates to Robin's book, 43, according to Robin Price with annotated bibliography. And this is from uh, 2008. This book invites the reader into Robin's community of books artists and artists books. It is ambitious, even operatic in scale and sweep, holding two accordions, the lower one comprised of vibrant maps beneath a second accordion of texts that live on a translucent sheet, another palimpsest. The texts disport along a winding blue ribbon of river against a subtle graphing pattern that acts like a scaffold to hold the texts on the page. Price identified key texts in well-loved books and determined her selections through a counting technique generated from the number 43, thus integrating chance and a sense of play into this process and the resulting tenor of the book. Some prints on show emerged out of extra sheets from 43. The actions on the prints may include monoprint, pressure printing, and hand coloring with collage underneath. On this print titled Time in 43, in the large print, re on the large type rather, we read, I taste a liquor never brewed. And below, in small type and from a different source, unconscious, instinctive. Those words are touched just by a record of Robin's fingertips created through cyanotype. Well, I'll end my comments with a third grouping, the body cyanotypes. This is extended offering that we saw earlier. In this group of prints, the touch on the page that we saw a minute ago in Time in 43 now expands to welcome the artist's body, suspended in blue, which occupies a central place in each print. The cyanotypes with hand coloring are at once intimate and restrained, again, held in balance just. They are free of text, the prints telling their story in saturated blues that record the touch, the body masking the sun's exposure on the sheet. We imagine the light as painting, the artist's presence traced here, as if to mark a gathering in and release of dis-ease. So with this kind of work, I am reminded of a much earlier work of Robbins, her Language of Her Body from 2003. You are looking at the sensual lines here of a nude in photographs by Derek Dudek. Held in a landscape format, the body in the book extends as if in a stretch, absolutely at ease. The images are accompanied by Keiji Shinohara's Sumi'i ink and wash paintings and a text by Amy Bloom. The painting and the language and the body joined in a graceful synergy. So from the studied elegance and beauty of that book, Let's then return to extended offering as I finish my remarks, made some 16 years later. Here we have the artist's body as paintbrush, expressing a fundamental human desire to be at one with the natural world and in direct communication with the viewer. No separation, transformed with her mark making into this completed print to offer us that moment in time and in this artist's journey. What luck that we have this work. Thank you, Robin. And thank you, Betty. Um, I was particularly struck by your phrasing of an invitation to a community of books um, in talking about 43. And I, I feel like this exhibit also has an invitation um, to it that uh, I think really sums up just the emotion that we feel when we walk in, that it's an invitation to um, Robin's whole corpus of work, but also to Robin herself. Uh, and with that said, I'd, I'd like us to segue into our question and answer section. Um, for those of you listening at home, <laughs> as I said at the beginning, feel free to submit your questions through the chat. Um, I have that open and I'll keep track of all of that. Um, and as you're thinking, uh, I'll start off with um, the first question that I wrote down uh, which is that 
we the the panelists and myself have spent a lot of time talking about Robin in the past tense, talking about this as sort of a retrospective. Um, but this is, I think, mostly to Robin, but certainly uh, the rest of you can answer as well, is that what's the next step from here? If you know, <laughs> which you may not. <laughs> Um, I said the first thing that came to mind was hell if I know. Um, before I try to answer that, I want to thank so very much Betty and Ruth and Harry and Meredith for your comments. Thank you very, very much. Um, where to? Uh, the next project is um, a title I can't remember, but a lot of you have seen the prototype of an agave plant. Ecological. Yeah. All right. Um, more desire, I'm going to just talk about a different thing that's coming after that. An ecological reckoning. Thank you, Shannon. If you go to my website, you can see it. Um, there's something called folded meditation also coming that um, is going to be a small edition and all handwritten um, and uh, pointing to the power or uh, looking at paying attention and uh, how that might be looked at from all different points of view. So I'm collecting lots of different writers on that and excerpting and writing in a spiral circle on a large sheet. Um, and just the act of handwriting has become so important to me the last few years in part because, no, I'm not going to go there. I love that it, it's what various people have been talking about, that kind of direct connection. It, it just, you know, I feel my connection to others, whoever might see this work while I'm writing. And so it's an embodied experience and very exciting to do. And um, I want to play with cyanotypes a lot more, uh, both especially with using my body and doing that in book form as well as more two-dimensional work. That's what comes to mind right now. Oops, I can't hear her. Nope. <laughs> yeah, thank you. That was... Um beautifully said. That's something that I sort of knew, but I don't <laughs> everybody else knew. Um, to, I think, follow up on that, um, you have imbued a lot of personality in your work. That's, I think, what each of us really um, on the panel talked about quite a bit was using words like personhood and, and um, selfhood and using those terms uh, in conjunction with courage. Um, and so I think perhaps, Harry, you could speak to this as well, but how uh, do, you, do you perceive that sort of shift where um, something begins as a bunch of separate pieces um, put together or as an idea? And at what point do you feel that the and this is perhaps bold to say, but where yourself kicks in or where your, um, where the courage or where the risk is there, is there, do you think an inflection point where that sort of happens? So are you talking both about like a lot of this work drawing from different sources? Yeah, yeah. And, and then where does the selfhood slash risk come in? Is that? Yes, that is exactly what I'm talking about. Okay. Well, I'll go, I'll go directly to the, 
to hmm. some of the risk here is literally being kind of new with the the cyanotype process and so uh <laughs> after you know 35 years or so uh being a letterpress printer and and you know eventually i re i reached a level of of technical uh excellence um and uh and then you know with slurring at bottom that whole you know let's look at what what does perfection mean and kind of going from there but um it it felt risky to work with i mean this work feels so new to me all of it and um and and so um and i also haven't been doing so many um monotypes <laughs> uh, just I'll explain technically what that what it what the, the kind I did uh, for most of these was there was a solid large plexiglass plate locked up in the bed of my Vandercook and it was up to type high and I used usually hand rollers um, to put color on there and um, for example if someone yeah, mm, the 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 piece that's called at rest. Um, on that one, there was uh, actually there was yellow on the press, and then I was using my hand to draw the lines. Maybe you can find it to draw the lines across directly onto the plate, um, and um, and so another. Another risk is that I was really interested in seeing, like I said before, what kind of colors could come out. And on some of the ones, it just didn't, like I had too much ink on the page. There wasn't enough, um, enough uh, left for absorbing the cyanotype emulsion and they just kind of looked like mud. <laughs> um, but uh, um, like I was so excited by that vibrant lime green that came out on that particular piece um so um yes that one thank you yeah that's what i'm talking about um those are dried philodendron leaves uh from a plant that i've had that we've had for many years and i named esmeralda okay um in terms of the disparate parts, it, the, I'm grabbing things in the studio that, that there's just so much accumulation of the past years where I have been making artwork that is really about finding my way through recovery. And very little of it has been, you know, completed and made into something that I am offering up, um, as, you know, for sale, <laughs> um, or yeah, very, very little was completed until now. And so I had, I had a whole lot to draw from, but it was also kind of confusing because there was just so much. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm empty at the moment, so I'll, I'll go on. If there's any other questions or um... yeah, we do have a question in the chat. Um, but yeah, that was definitely I think very uh, well put, Robin. And I, I mean, I I think so much of this is evident of your own process um, and of your own. Um, approach that so much of yourself is just sort of automatically part of it. Uh, the question asked in the chat is, uh, is there also an undercurrent of absence here? <sighs> Hold on. Oh. Uh, 
I'm, I'm just gonna, you immediately made me think again about um, Danielle Vogel's uh, writing uh, and this part of the lines that I read uh, between us will create another sustainable self, a communal body existing in the wake of an absent one. Later in the book, there are these lines. A self that was once uninhabitable. A childhood coiled up like some shame shed. skips over a couple of lines, until this body arrived in the present, as if for the first time. So I, <laughs> I've only read the first 16 pages of her book, but, um, I, but so, 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 so she's talking about an absence and, and, and her book, she's very much about like this meeting place uh, there's another sentence that's something like, there's, with, with just one word on the page or one letter, uh, we are uh, immediate, automatically or immediately or something in each other's lungs. Um, so I think... I. So honestly, I will say that <clears throat> I haven't thought much about the concept of absence here, but I do know, I just have some intuition that that something within my recovered self now has something to offer and um, and try to make a connection with you. And so uh, maybe that speaks of an absence that is still present in the work, um, but is just reaching out. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that... Um that feeling of absence is often visceral. Um, and so perhaps it might, you know, I would like to actually open that up to our other panelists to yeah. see kind of what their uh, take is and if they have felt that same absence, even though I only Ruth has seen the work also in person, um, but if perhaps, you know, that they were struck by that similar um, moment of of lack that feeling of lack is maybe perhaps too strong a word but perhaps you you feel that way yes betty well i just sent you a, a comment privately but <laughs> i said I, I actually has not have not been struck with the absence with this body work so much but what i said in my um chat was that it just seemed like at this historical moment the way all of this has coalesced we are in a moment around the world right now, and particularly in this country, where that what I sense of the healing and and the coming forward in these works might offer us almost like a, a an opportunity for us to help imagine what the next thing might be. We have been living in such a lack that it's a gift to see images like this. Some of these images they are universal. You know, there there are these these. Um, outpourings of, of need and hope and healing that I respond to very clearly. So for me, it's the opposite. I don't see the lack. I see a way that I can imagine, you know, getting up tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You bet. <laughs> can, I can I interject since that was my question? Hey, yeah. Michelle. Hi. Hi. What I'm seeing is the absence of ego, the absence mm. of um, thank you clutter, the absence <laughs> of um, a linear path, mm. um, things like that. And you know, the cyanotypes have so much negative space, that ghostly presence of you, which is actually 
the empty space is is mm -hmm. the part that you are um, in the white and um, the negative space. And I find that the absence in that is what draws the viewer in to participate. There's room. Mm. That's all. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm actually having a little trouble following uh, right now. So there was something that you said early on. <laughs> I can't exactly remember what it was. But, but thank you for making that clarification. Absence. And thanks for the, and thanks for the question. Absence of ego, Robin. Oh, thank you, Betty. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. Um, yeah, that's, um, thank you so much. That is indeed something that I think about a lot. And, um, uh, Gosh, Connell Gallagher, who was the longtime curator at University of Vermont Library Special Collections, uh, maybe 20 years ago or something, called me uh, a chameleon, chameleon among bur bu book artists. And um, uh, my work. I am hoping to make my work look as different as possible and not be recognizable from a distance. That, that kind of not having a style thing, even though of course there's, I can't kind of get away from it, but um, that, that, was, that was important from early on to me. And, um, and I feel like that, um, the way that that's easy for me to do is that I, I just am immersing into the content of whatever the project is. And for example, with Love in the Time of War, I immersed in those poems for years before I started production. And I mean, I was doing trials and that sort of thing, but mainly living and feeling like those poems were inside of me and and i i actually love that ability about myself because i i just like in books like that i just want to be in that headspace i want to be those poems and have them mm, you know have them come out uh in in a way in a way that i can honor them um I, I want to go back. I'm sorry, I don't remember exactly. It was kind of early on uh, in this little chunk of time talking about, um, yes, Betty, it was you, the, the time that we are in. <laughs> and um, I, I had bet a lot of you out there watched Van Jones on CNN on Saturday late morning after the Biden-Harris victory was declared. Um, and... So with tears, he, he talked about how, for those who have suffered the most these past four years, black people and Muslims, this is a time to get some, some peace and a chance for a reset. And so very much this work that has been made during the summer um, I have, I know that oh, a lot, um, there, th that there was influence um, from paying a lot of attention to what was being projected by the Movement for Black Lives and, for example, the Academy of American Poets on their wonderful Poem a Day uh, project that you get a new email every day with the uh, the new poem and a little photo of the poet and them reading the poem and uh, a brief, whatever they want to write about it. And so many of the poets this summer and continuing uh, are black writers. And 
I've gotten such, I, like many, I've gotten such nourishment from that. And uh, there was uh, uh, kind of, uh, the, 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 there was work that didn't end up going into the exhibit um, that was a poem by Evie Shockley. Um, and um, I think, so, so what I feel like that, um, that uh, um, coming into myself, the, 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 the part of it that is, um, that I can articulate as being the most influential is the part of, you know, speak truth and say the names. And I'll just go back to the book that, um, the unique book that I just finished with um, a line, with some lines from Yusef Komunyaka's A World of Daughters. Losing my train of thought. Anyone want to help me remember what I was just saying? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but no. You were going to read a poem. Are you Steph? Well, you're, yeah, talking, you're talking about your unique book with Komenyaka. Yeah. And a few lines. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Okay. The title. The title is "Say Her Name." In the in the lines, the the last few lines of the poem, say "Dink," say "Dinknesh." Hold on. Which one is right? I'm so sorry, everybody. Thanks for being patient. So this is the last of the text sheets and the last of the lines in that poem. It begins in memory. Now say her name, say Dinknesh, mother of us all. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Uh, referring to the African name for uh, that amazing fossil, fossil that most of us know as Lucy. Yeah. So the Say Her Name title is both that uh, the, 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 um, in, the mm, directive to the reader, say, starts the poem and occurs a few times within and then closes that way. And to me that just really connects with uh, what we've learned from Movement for Black Lives in terms of the power of speaking the names of those whose lives have been taken in vain. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's, um, I, when, uh, the book first came in and then um, Anne Bromer came uh, to visit and, and saw the book. That was actually her initial reaction was say her name kind of is a, a mm. grander statement than just this. Yeah. Um, I think we have reached an hour and, and I think that that's actually a really powerful note to end on is um, how the work not only speaks to you, Robin, how it speaks to me as, as um, the, the gallery manager who's been hanging out with it for so long, um, or even just to all of us who are gathered here tonight, but to kind of what's going on in the world at large. And that's, um, I think we'll all agree that that's what makes great art is that it speaks beyond ourselves. Um, so I'd like to thank all of our panelists, um, Ruth, Harry, Betty, um, and Robin for spending some time with us. Um, I'd like to thank my coworker, Shannon, who's been off in the wings and <laughs> keeping me on track and um, has been the one fielding all the slides. Can you type in um, that I was so very influenced by? Said, thank you all and um, have good nights. Mm -hmm.